I'm an English language teacher. Um, I'm teaching in the interior region of Sabah. It's a, it's a vocational school. So it's an isolated place. I've been teaching in that school for five years. Uh, many people do not like to, that, to go to that place because it's surrounded by mountains and sometimes fog. And to be honest, it's quite scary. But um, at the same time, many people are surprised. Although I've been teaching for five years, um, and you know, despite where I came from, from the interior region, I was born in a village, and now I'm teaching in another village. But many people were surprised because over the five years, I've ac accumulated lots of national and international awards in teaching competitions. You see, I love to compete. I'm quite competitive, and as a teacher, it's also seen in my students. When I first started teaching, the school didn't have any achievement, especially in academic competitions. But under my training, uh, we won lots of competitions, debate, public speaking, innovation, entrepreneurship. So because I always believe in developing students' potential. Now, um, um, I was in the top 50 finalists for Global Teacher Prize 2017. Um, there were over 20,000 teachers in the world who applied, who competed for the, for, the, for the award. So they narrowed it down to 50 finalists, and I was one of them. Um, I was the first Sabahan, and I was the only Malaysian this year. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, um, as an English, as a, for us teachers, the problem that we, we usually face in our school is that because of the location of, my, of our school, we usually face lots of problems where, where we cannot really, my students have limited experience and exposure to the outside world. So even for us, to, for us to travel to the closest city, which is Kota Kinabalu, it's only costly. And then our school, we don't have much resources. Uh, we also do not have much capacities and financial resources and so on. And uh, being in this community, in, in a community in, in a rural area, uh, we also have to deal with deeply in such traditions, attitudes, and expectations that might not be aligned with how we would like the school to, to change. So these are the challenges that I'm facing in my school, that we are facing. And I believe there are other schools out there that are facing similar challenges. Challenges that widen the gap between, uh, between the urban school and the rural school, between the rich and the poor, between the marginalized and privileged. However, to me, for the first time ever, Despite the gap, despite the difference, there's something that most of these schools share. In, even schools like us in, in, an, in the interior region. Something that can revolutionize education. In fact, he has already started revolutionizing it. And to me, that is digital literacy. So people everywhere, including students in my own school, so they have smartphones, tablets, computers, uh, and they, they, they have access to internet, although it's very limited. They know how to use it. They spend so much time on it. In fact, I think most of us do. Uh, so nothing has been this omnipotent. So this technological evolution, um, it's accessible, it's affordable, it's convenient, uh, and it will only get better. So I believe that this is the key to transformation of education. Because in the past, teachers were seen as the source of knowledge. So our job was to enter classroom and to deliver knowledge to the students. So the students just relied heavily on the teachers. So, te so students went to the school, they sat properly in the class, and they listen to every single word that the teachers were telling them. But now we live in the era where information is literally at the tips of our fingers. So students themselves have quick access to a large amount of information that only grows exponentially as internet becomes more ubiquitous. So the question that we usually ask ourselves is that how do we teachers remain relevant? When, you know, for, for students, they can just uh, Google everything in the internet. Why will they listen to, uh, why will they be sitting in a classroom uh, listening to every fact that the teachers were telling them when they can just you know, Google everything nowadays and in a, quick, in, in a few seconds you have quick access to never-ending comprehensive facts from all of sort of resources. You don't even have to memorize it. You, just, you can just download it, save it, share, click and swipe because that's what people do nowadays. So, and that's the reality for us teachers. You know, how do we teach us remain relevant? Because in the future, as technology becomes more and more prominent, we might be out of jobs because people don't, probably don't even go to schools anymore. And how, do we, how, do, how, can we be, how can we assure that the school remains significant? So because of that, we need to have something to offer. So I'm very interested in this standard for students for school students. It's actually proposed by uh, Easter, 
which stands for International Society for Technology in Education. Now, one of the criteria states that students need to be empowered learners. So now with technology, students need to learn to harness the power of technology to direct their own learning and to set their own goals. So they are becoming more and more independent in their learning uh, with, with the technology. Because technology, the truth is, it grants students the power to decide. They have the autonomy to choose how they're going to meet their learning goals, to explore and reflect upon the steps that they take and produce different outcomes according to their preferences. And the most important thing about technology is that technology else actually helps students to acquire transferable skills. Transfer transferable skills mean skills that you can apply with anything, with any new emerging technology. Every time there's a new technology, students are good in applying, this, applying the skills that they learn so they can use any new technology that is emerging. So now students have become adaptable learners who can pretty much do anything. So they are no longer students like probably in the past where they depend so much on what teachers or anyone else you know, train them to do. As for teachers, there's also an Easter standard for teachers. So one of the standards for teachers is that we teachers, we need to be leaders. We need to uh, seek to promote students' empowerment. So in schools, we don't tell students the what because they know how to figure out the what. With, with technology, you can just pretty much Google anything. So our job is to help students discover how they can learn better and how they, they can apply what they learn in the school in the real world. So in 2016, I won an international teaching competition. Um, it's called Teacher at My Heart. So there were five global winners. I was the only one from Asia. So I teach English language. I teach spelling, grammar, speaking, and writing. But the reason why I was selected as one of the five winners because I focused on developing my students' presentation skills and critical thinking skills. Skills that could empower them to develop and demonstrate their abilities and ideas. So the project is called HIVE, which stands for Highly Intellectual and Valiant Enthusiasts. So actually the name of, of the, the program, uh, the, the project, was inspired from an evil organization in, in DC Universe. So I was watching this te television series and, and, and I heard about Hive, so I thought that was an interesting name. So I, I, I used it as the name for my project, but then I, 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 I named it as something else, so Highly Intellectual and Valiant Enthusiasts. So the project acknowledges that every student has their passion that they would like to pursue, and then we also acknowledge that students have great minds, hence intellectual, and great hearts, uh, hence valiant. So with this project, I use, um, I use simple techniques, such as Camper, Qmatics, Six Thinking Hats, Thinking Maps. So these tools might be common, but with innovative applications, they can really be effective in uh, fulfilling the criteria for 21st century learning, uh, especially the concept of four Cs, where students need to be creative, critical, collaborative, and communicative. Um, and in integrating technology into the classroom, it's also very important for us teachers to remind ourselves that technology has to enhance learning and not just to di digitize learning, which means uh, it has to help to increase the effectiveness of learning. So when students use technology, they actually learn better than they were before. So not in a way that it is just a replacement of paper. So previously they used paper papers, so now they use computers and Basically, it's pretty much the same, but then there's no difference in terms of effectiveness. So learning with technology, we need to make sure that it actually enhances the learning, but not just to merely digitize it. So, um, but then another factor why I want to teach at my heart, like what I said before, I'm quite competitive. So I train my students for all of these, co of competition, for all these competitions. So I always believe, in, because they live in the interior region of, of, this, uh, of this place, so they have limited experience to the outside world. So I do believe that it's very important for them, for me, to give them the experience to, go, to just go out, you know, meet people and, just, and do amazing things. And, and I think competition is a, is a good way of it, for them to get out of the comfort zone and really to experience things that they don't get to experience in the school. One of the, most, uh, one of the greatest memories that I ever had, when I first started teaching in 2012, I was assigned with, 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 to, to train the debate team. So I was quite new at that time, I was naive. And I, when I, when I uh, trained the debate team, the students, they had lower English proficiency, and they had, their attitude wasn't really the one that you expected. And I was quite upset with, with, with the students that I actually had, because 
I mean, the, the school, they never won any competition, especially debate competition. But then because I was assigned to do the job, so I was just, you know, let's just do this. But then when we, so we practice and we practice, we, and then we, you know, we practice. So when, when the competition, um, when the day of the competition came, the students somehow, they did well. So they went from one round to another round, winning one round after another. And then they made it to the final, which I, was, I wasn't expected. I didn't expect it, expect it at all. But the problem is, I made a mistake as a teacher. I underestimated them. I, I thought that they wouldn't be able to do it. I doubted them. So what the mistake that I did was that, you know, in a competition, you have lots of rounds, you know, finals, you have finals, semi-finals. So we didn't practice for the final. And the final was on the next day. But because I could see some improvement, they really improved, and I, and I was impressed. Uh, with the improvement that they were able to make. So we decided to, to spend the whole night uh, preparing for, for the final debate and all the texts and so on, all the practice. So we didn't sleep. So on that particular day, that competition, the final uh, took place. So my students were doing really well. They were killing it. And we thought we were winning it. But in a, debate, in a school debate competition back then, you, couldn't, you can't make certain mistakes. And then my students, because they didn't have enough sleep and so on, just at the end of the debate, they were supposed to oppose the topic, and they said, we agreed with the topic. The person said, I agreed with the topic, and just like that, we lost the debate. So they cried, and I was so upset too. I was so sad because we could have done this, and I blame myself. I blame myself because it's my fault. We could have won it. They did really well. They worked really hard, but because I underestimated them, I thought they couldn't do it. I doubted them. So we didn't practice for the final, and I didn't really pay attention to what they were doing. So I thought if only I could have spent time, a little bit more time, if only I had been working harder, if only I could turn back time, it, could, it would be completely different. So that's where the turning point for me. I vow, as a teacher, I will never ever underestimate my students. And I believe that all of us here should not underestimate ourselves of what we are capable of. Because these kids, they come from village. They, they couldn't really speak English, but they could do things, all of these things, because they practice and they work hard. So we, spe we had to wait for another year. So this time around, because, and then the worst part about it was that the students were, were, the, were in their final year. That means they lost, they, was, they were so upset, they were so sad, they were crying, and they couldn't do it anymore. So on the following year, I recruit a new team. But this time around, we practice really hard. So I know that for most people, debate competition, just for district level, it probably didn't mean anything. But for me at that time, and for the school and for, for my kids, it, it meant everything. So we practice and practice. I think other people in other schools, they only practice debate for like two weeks. One month, we practice for a whole year. And then when that day came, that this, this debate competition that we were so determined to win, my students did well. So they won one round after another unanimously. And in the final, they, we won unanimously. And then the judges said that it has never been before a debate team that won the final and the previous round with all judges voted for them. So it was a record, break it was a record breaking winning. And the most important thing is that, you know, when you, you know, thank you. So, so kudos, kudos to my kids. So the moral value is that, you know, when you, work, when, you, when you want something so bad, you really want it. It, seem impos it seems impossible, but you really want it because, you know, people say nothing is impossible and you work so hard for it. You push the hardest you can possibly do. Um, and, you know, you, you did everything that you could. You used everything that you had, and then at the end, you made it. We made it. My kids made it. They won, and we did it. So that was the beginning. And after that, we, we, be, we, became, we, we won lots of competitions. Uh, even now, even last week, my students won some competitions. So we, we, do, we do a lot of things. But that particular uh, moment, that particular story was the, most, was the one that inspired, that motivated me uh, to actually do more for my students. So another competition that I won early this year, it's called Express Publishing EFL Scholarship Award. So it's another competition for English language teacher. Uh, and I became the first winner of, the, of this competition, of this uh, sponsor. Um, uh, for, my, for my idea, where I, for my learning 
practice where I actually geared my students for Industry 4.0. So I'm pretty sure you are all familiar with Industry 4.0, which is the fourth industrial revolution where machines are solely replacing humans in doing manual labor. So the goal of this project is to, is to help students develop employability skills so they can adapt to these changes and continue to remain relevant. So the name of the project Idiotrix was if, if Hive was inspired from, from, a D, from DC Universe, so Idiotrix was, was inspired from Harry Potter Universe. So it's a project-based learning. Um, it refers to the development of the project ideas to, to, to do several stages. So project-based learning, um, it's, it's actually a learning practice where students identify a problem and then they try to find a solution to that problem. So one of our most uh, successful outcomes of this project was, uh, was, an was a series of educational outreach where my students, uh, they use the project to help rural children. So, they, we, so we usually visit uh, primary schools and we conduct activities on, on the school students. So it's, it's very important to prepare the students to changes because changes are imminent. And the thing about changes, they are constant, they are unpredictable, and they can have so much effects on our life more than we are aware of. So we teachers, we are also struggling with these changes. Because these changes, where technology is becoming more and more integral of our life, will we teachers be able to remain relevant? Or will we be soon replaced by technology? Will, will, will students even go to school if they could just learn in any other place or if they could just learn at home? So that is a question that is becoming more and more obvious for us. So it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's definitely, it could be a threat, but to me it is an opportunity. So see, we teachers, we need to embrace technology. So we, we, we have to evolve as technology evolves, as education evolves, as, as our students evolve. So in moving forward, teaching and learning need to be built upon the interaction and collaboration between the teachers and students. Because we need to get some insights from the students also to improve teaching practice. So um, I, I developed this principle, I call it the three P's, that I used to engage my students in learning. So the three P's stands for purpose, passion, and potential. Because I'm a language teacher, so everything that I do, it, I usually play, play with the language. So first of all, purpose. So in, ev in everything that we do, there's a reason why we do it. Same goes with learning. So students need to have their own purpose why they go to school, why they attend classes, why they attend my classes. So we teachers are not the ones who, who are supposed to be giving them the reasons. But then, we, because they need to determine their own purposes, but we can help them discover their purposes. So the desire to fulfill a goal really drives students to focus on their learning and to engage in their learning. Uh, so from my observation, those who do not have, who have little interest in schools, are usually those who do not have clear, solid reason why they go to the school in the first place. So usually students, for some students, going to school they, they go to school because the parents tell them to do so, because the government makes it mandatory, because the teachers expect them to do so. So they are told to you know, study hard, to pass the exams, to get some qualifications, and finally to graduate so they can get a job. But these are the supposed reasons given by the people around them. And if you notice, they're, they're all the same, they're very generic. So we, we fail to acknowledge individual differences and in how these students need to have their own reasons because every, every single student is unique and every student possesses their own interests and talents. So the second P is passion. So I believe everyone has their own hobbies, interests, things that you love doing. So it could be just anything. And I believe it's, it's our responsibility teachers to help students discover their passion. So the thing about passion, it can be anything. And we can't judge people who, for what they are passionate about. Because I think some of the most successful individuals in the world are very passionate about what they do. So for us teachers to, ex to help students discover, explore, and tap into their interests, we can't judge them, we can't label them, and we can't underestimate them. If anything, passion is the, the most important fundamental part of learning if we can draw it from the students and get them to actually use it or apply it or integrate it into their own learning, it, it's going to be amazing. Which leads me to my final P, which is uh, potential. So you have all of this, you have the purpose, you have the passion, so how are you going to turn them into reality? So the last one is potential, where students need to develop and demonstrate what they can really achieve with the skills and abilities. And as for us teachers, we help students to develop their potential, to hone their skills, so they can really reach the, 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 the fullest potential, of course. So this is the concept of the three Ps that I use to engage my students in, in learning. But then, um, I also believe that uh, it applies to all of us. And as for me, teachers, I need to you know, figure out my, my purpose. Why am I doing what am I doing? What is it for me? So I think that's a question that we all would like to ask ourselves. 
and then of course to discover our patient, what, find out what, what we really like and how we integrate what we like into, into what we do. So, you know, it's to turn it into reality. And last one is that I need to develop my potential too so I can be better in what I do. Most important thing, I can be, I can be, um, I can be inspiring and as, aspiring and inspired individuals and help others become one. So what I'm trying to tell other people, and especially my students and all of you, is that you don't, you don't, you, you never ever, don't ever ever underestimate yourself. In everything that you do, you go it all out, you put your hearts and your minds into it, and whatever that happens, you're going to enjoy it, you're going to like it, you will not regret it. With that, thank you.